Welcome back to the shop, everyone. It's in my Chef Knife Chapter 3, and we are off to the races here. Now, we had got done heat treating, we've gotten the results that we wanted, and uh, now we are putting the final grind on our Chef Knife. Now, as we've talked about before, these things are kind of squirrely beasts with the um, soft steel over the hard core and with the thinness of everything, so we're just trying to grind symmetrically and do a similar amount from both sides as we work our way to the thinness that we want. Here I've got a Gator um, A160 belt. That's roughly equivalent to uh, 120 grit. I actually started using this a lot more than um, like ceramic 120 belts on knives like this anyway. It's got a better belt feel, less belt bump, a little bit thicker, a little bit more cushy, and you get a more uniform scratch pattern plus they last longer it's just a little bit more deluxe feeling of a grind than like a red ceramic 120 belt and the edges on these are nicer for plunge cuts so just try not to heat things up too much grinding without gloves making sure just to keep everything cool and we're just trying to take off any nasty 36 grit scratches and thin that edge down the last little bit we had been uh, about 30 thou going into heat treat. Now we're taking it down to a flat grind of 20 thou, dead flat grind from 110 down to 20. And then uh, we are going to slightly convex it, the lower third of the blade, down to about 5 thou. You can see me going with the micrometer there. Um, I'm at about 10 here. And then I'll just kind of keep going once I get down to about 7 or 8 with this blade. Uh, convexing that last little bit there. And very subtly. Um, then I'm going to go to my next finer grit. Uh, a Gator A100 that's about 220-ish. And then once I get uh, everything good with that belt. And get my finish edge thickness. I'm going to go with like a, uh, a Gator A45, that's about a 400-ish grit. Here I've gone to the Gator A45, gotten the blade pretty much, and then the last kind of step that I'm doing here is putting that final um, convex shape on the heel of the knife there, and then a little bit later on the spine. And I'm doing this on the left edge of the platen, on the left hand um, built Broadbeck grinder. So this thing is again built opposite to most grinders. These will assemble in reverse. So I'm just rounding it um, from that side and then also from this side of the platen I can get the bottom of the choil on the other side of the knife. You don't ever want to be stuffing steel up into the belt. You want it to be like a, a trailing edge on whatever you're grinding. And then get about vertical but not not continue to where you're pushing things up into the belt. And it's also easy to see that. It's pretty safe and it's easy to see when you're grinding stuff downwards to blend it in. So I can do those two surfaces from here. The um, mark side of the heel and the reverse side of the bottom of the choil. And here I'm going to the spine and just kind of rolling it in. One thing you want to make sure is to not apply too much pressure uh, on your tang hand there when you're rounding the spine up there near the where the front of the handle will be. Otherwise you'll get a slight dip very easily and it looks extremely dumb having a slight dip in your spine going into your handle. Just one of those things. Much like it's easy to get a slight dip in the heel of your knife from belt sharpening it. Just got to watch out for it. And here we are over on the right hand assembled Broadbeck grinder. We're doing now the reverse side of the heel, and we're going to do the mark side of the underneath of the choil here and kind of meet what blending we did from the other side on the previous grinder. Same grit belt, a 400, well, a Gator A45. And uh, man, I did this for years just on the one grinder by hook or by crook, it can be done, but it's just easier and like more stress-free to do a symmetrical job quickly with um, right and left hand grinders here. And I'll just feel around the edges of everything and look at it and make sure that 
um, it not only looks blended, but it it feels blended without any actual real-world hot spots. Now, once I've got this step complete, all the way down the spine, everything like that, everything feels good. We have our uh, my finished ground, uh, so we're gonna go to hand sanding next. Okay, let's try this bad boy out. So I get some knife making supplies from Maritime Knife Supply up in Canada, actually. And that is a really good company. It's run by a real nice guy. And um, I got this from them to try. It's an Orion Knife Works, made in Poland, by a knife maker. Uh, it's 3D printed. You can see all the print paths on it. But it's pretty well built. A hand sanding stick. Uh, repositionable paper clamping hand sanding stick. And you can get it with different inserts here. This is a flat one, or you can put like a curved radius pieces in here. I got a uh, 36 inch one for trying that out on some of my compound grinds, but we got the flat one and uh, I haven't tried this yet at all. So we're going to put some 400 on it, do the flat of the Ricasso here, and then come here. I'm not expecting this to be a one size fits all. Um, let's see, how are we doing this? Yeah, we're putting this through here. Uh, that's not really <laughs> the smart way to do it. Let's put it through here first. It comes up. You don't need very much coming out to clamp. Just got to get the paper straight. Then we'll press this clamp, thread the paper through there. And I, I'm thinking that you're, you're going to want to have all the slack out. Because we all know how paper kind of bunches up. There, that's pretty nice and flat. I'm not expecting this to be a uh, one and done sanding fixture here because... You kind of can't see the edge of it, i.e. maybe it's not the greatest for like sanding details. But for the bulk work of this big flat blade, I'm hoping it's going to work out pretty nice. So far it's real comfortable to use. And what I like is that it's keeping my um, left hand here away from the dangerous pretty much sharp edge of this blade. I mean, it's, it's down to about five thou, but it's ground to the point where it almost has a burr and it will definitely cut you. And this is keeping my hand away from that and I like that. So that's a small section of paper in there. So it does get used up pretty quick. Let's see how this goes. I suppose enough fresh paper to get over the pad there. That's pretty easy to do. And we'll just pull this lever, yank the extra paper through tight, go back at it. Oh yeah, I like this thing. Definitely gonna get some use. Um, so this, of course, is a wrought jacket over a hardened core. So. Anytime the core is exposed, it sands a lot harder. It's, it's more wear resistant. And anytime you're on the wrought iron, you can really tell because it sands and you get the scratches out almost immediately. It feels very soft. Nice thing about sand mine is if you have some particularly brutal edge steel, I use screw force V in sand mine a lot. You don't have to sand a whole blade worth of Mono steel crew forge V. If just the core is made out of it, you might have to sand a third of the blade height each side. And that's a lot more forgiving than sanding a whole blade high of a chef knife, you know, two inch, two inch plus width of crew forge V. Let me tell you, there's a reason I don't make mono crew forge V integrals anymore.
So just going back and forth over a lengthwise direction here. Nominally about a 400 grit belt finish, but I didn't get all the scratches out. So we're just gonna go for it until the blade's good. You guys probably know how this goes. I'm putting a fair amount of pressure and I have, I have done uh, wet sanding a lot at other points. I mean, I've been making knives for like 20 years now. So there were definitely periods of, you know, five years at a time or more where I was using a lubricant when sanding. Uh, I've tried Windex. That might've been a Nick Wheeler thing. I've tried Simple Grain. That's a, a Wayne Goddard thing. I like both of them. I like Simple Grain a little bit better. It reeks less than Windex. Uh, I've tried just plain water. I think maybe Don Hansen does that. Um, I've even tried like WD-40 and mobile oil. Everyone swears by a different thing. However, I just get tired of having messy hands that are like soaked and all gray and wrinkled and uh, getting like water and grit contamination on the other side of my blade as I'm sanding and stuff, particularly if I'm sanding the second side. Um, and I'm not convinced it really prolongs the life of sandpaper that much. I can tell the difference between clogged sand sandpaper and worn out sandpaper. And even sanding dry here, it's not that it's getting clogged as much as, I mean, if you knock the dust out of that, it's still dull sandpaper. So I'm not gonna be, I'm not gonna, going to spend a lot of my time at the expense of a small savings on sandpaper. I just throw it away when it stops cutting. And I just eliminate all the mess by sanding dry again. And I've been doing that for a few years and yeah, it's working fine for me. For now, who knows, maybe I'll go back at some point, but if anyone wanted an explanation on why I'm just sitting here, not spraying anything on the blade, that's it. Here we're at 400 grit on this side. You can see the little slag inclusions. Pretty minimal plunge line blending in there at the top because it's a very low angle change. A suggestion of a plunge more than anything. Let's see if I can like move that light a little bit so you guys can see the blade a little better. Well, let's turn it off. And now we're talking. 400 grit. Rhino wet. And that's good for now. I'll go over it one more time after I've got the other side sanded. Probably need to come back and sand out any blemishes then. But you can really see the transition line now. And I've eliminated all belt scratching. So we're ready to flip it over and sand the mark side. Well, that's typically how my bench looks after I've been sanding stuff. Just a bunch of used up Rhino Wet Red Line strips. Most of it is 400 grit. So I got a good uh, solid 400 grit base finish on here now. And uh, I'm going to leave it at, at that until I get all the rest of the knife made, basically. And then before I glue it, I'll go back over for a final finish. So this thing has been working well. I used it quite a bit. Um, but my main jam is still actually this thing. I'll tell you a little bit about it and why I like it. So this is 3 8 by 3 quarter inch mild steel bar by uh, about a foot long and on uh, one side I've bonded about a, a five inch piece of a uh, quarter inch thick baler belting that I cut down from larger baler belt stock. It's a hard rubber and uh, barge cement just fixes it very nicely to a steel bar. I have sanded a lot of knives with this. What I like about this, it's three quarters of an inch wide for one thing. So you get a little bit more pressure uh, per square inch when you're sanding, so it, it bites harder. Those of you who live in winter country will know that a thinner, taller tire is often nicer for snow and ice because it, it cuts down in farther and it doesn't slide as much. 
similar deal with this you're going to get a more aggressive sand and get the work done quicker at least in my experience with a somewhat narrower bar this is solid i can really push down on this hard i don't have to wrap paper all the way around it to hold it and i don't have to use any kind of spray glue or feathering adhesive either all i got to do is put this on here crimp it just lightly and i can just full strength sand this without having to really hold the paper except for maybe a little bit with my thumbs right here at the start that's it the rubber is grippy enough that it has enough friction on the back that um, the path of least resistance is for the paper to slide on the steel rather than slide on the rubber especially with this slight like belt surface texture to it so this really i mean you can put horsepower into the work and you don't have to wear your hands out like gripping the paper so as simple as it is i'm still sold on this as my main thing plus it blends very well as you cut with it but it, then again it's not so soft that you're going to get an unflat surface let me turn this light off we got a better look at the blade don't mind my messy floor a little disorganized in here so you can see after finished grinding in a hand sand the transition line has gotten even more interesting. Back here where it was a little boring before, there's some cool stuff. It got a little bit higher, but really there's like just some kind of keyholing and just cool wild activity in there. We're seeing slag inclusions, typical for rot. And uh, the Ricasso here is sanded all the way up to 400, both sides now. Um, so really I have a useful final dimension on the Ricasso thickness that now I can mill my bolster to. So that's why I'm now ready for handle work. So let's get into that next. Sometimes what I do is I dig into my drawer of handle templates that I've already drawn for various knives, dig out a handful of them, and then select a short list of ones I think would look good with the given blade. And those are these. Uh, yeah. These are just band names and albums that I had um, written down on here. A friend was telling me some, recommending some music to me in the shop. Uh, and that was the only thing I had to write on. So I like these ones. They have a nice heel hook. They have a nice subtle drop break right here. Maybe not that one. Let's see. Probably not that one. Maybe not that one. Maybe one of these two. And this one, this one is a little bit more narrow. So let's see how that's gonna fit. And I'm gonna grab another piece of thin cardboard here. Yeah, yeah. Right about like that. And I'm going to trace what we've got. All right, it's looking pretty good. Now, typically, we want this angle break to be right about between these knuckles, so to fall on the split hand right there. All right. Yeah, that's pretty good. Move that out to four for the grip length. And then uh, I think I'll move the knuckle brake forward a little bit on this one. We're just adapting this to suit the, the knife that we have on hand here. There we go. This was probably on a long bolster integral before. That. And we'll bring that line forward. So there's our line at four inches. Another thing I try to keep in mind is personally, I don't care for a ton of like 
in my mind, wasted handle material out, out there hanging out the end of your grip, at least on a lot of knives. I just kind of feel like, what's it there for other than to um, look cool? And there's a certain amount of it just being there to look cool that I'll tolerate, but I'm definitely not going to like have it hanging way out there like you'll see on some guys' knives. Not that I'm talking smack about other people's work, it's just not my, my cup of tea personally. So now we'll set the knife down on there. Now I do have to remember that we're going to be using some of this G10 for a little cap. This stuff is about about 3 8 or a 3 16 thick or a little heavier, maybe 200, let's see. Yeah, 200 and 208 thou there. It's just a scrap ripped piece. So we'll probably machine it down to, to 200 in the mill just to get it level and square. So we'll just say that that's 200 there. Yeah. So we'll mark how much of this handle length the um, bolster cap there is accounting for. There we go. Now I'll get the knife back on here and we'll mark where the actual tang shoulders are to get our height for our front of our handle. That looks pretty good. And we just gotta blend this line back to it. And I think that's gonna work just fine right there. Yeah, I like that. We'll trace the tang on there. All right, cool. So there's our basic handle template. Yeah, that's more than enough handle. Now looking at this, you can see I wanted my handle to be a little bit longer along the top and have a little forge slant to the front of the bolster just to improve flow. Um, the blade does not reflect that. So I'm going to trim back this tang shoulder a little bit. Let's mark it on pencil there to reflect the handle that we have designed. And I'm probably gonna grind the top of this a little bit lower, grind a little bit of vertical taper into it, uh, just to further modify the blade a little bit to fit the handle that we want. And then we'll go ahead and start fabricating the handle pieces. One thing to note here really quick is if you saw, I actually planted a couple fingers on the back side of the platen there um, while I'm grinding the uh, tang shoulders, at least to start with there. And that kind of helps me make smaller, more precise movements uh, with a greater margin of safety. See there, I'm doing that again. It's very easy to make just small kind of arcing controlled movements and just nibble little bits of steel off in a controlled fashion with a hand actually planted. A lot like welding, if you have a support hand, your bead looks a lot steadier than if, if you're not supported on something. Also, I have opted to go with Amboina instead of Desert Ironwood Burl. I had a piece of Desert Ironwood on the way from ArizonaIronwood.com, but turns out it actually wasn't in their inventory. Um, so 
it was crossed off the list, unfortunately. However, I also got a nice block of Amboina Burl from them and some of this cool um, stabilized black and white ebony from them. So this was the choice between these two. I went with this one because it seems like it suits the nature of the wrought iron and the sand mai better. It's a warmer tone and it has eyes in it, which kind of resemble the actual ball peen dimples along the pattern transition. So we're going with this. And then, uh, as I mentioned before, we're gonna have that little G10 handle cap. So what I'm gonna do is call out the nominal thickness of the handle, maximum thickness at three quarters of an inch. So I'm gonna set the scribes to 0 0.750. Right there, lock them. Now, I'm going to hopefully go over and get this G10 piece. So we're gonna use the wide end of it here. Just gonna scratch a line on it. And then I'll scratch a line where the height of it will be. There we go. I'm gonna get the baby square. Transfer that line back to the width line. Leave it a little bit wide for now. And we have a um, rectangle defined for our cut there. Then we'll just mill the surface parallel with the factory face of the G10. After I smoked both of these blades the other day, I put a different blade back in this one. So... Now... We get a set of uh, parallels in here, my tallest parallels. We're gonna set this down right in the middle so the jaw doesn't rack. Hold it down firmly on the parallels. Clamp it just baby snug. little tighter. Of course the parallels are wiggling a little bit now. Even though this is a nice curt vise, parts will still kick up a little. Parallels are tight under it. We got fairly good clamp pressure on it. I'm not going to take too heavy of a bite and develop a lot of tool pressure on it. Now, uh, Go ahead and find the surface and just quickly take it down parallel. I'll scribe a center line real quick on the front of the bolster stock. It's not really a full size bolster, it's like a handle cap or an escutcheon, if you will. There's a center line. You get one scratched on the back too, that could come in handy. All right, then. Uh, Need to locate the top and bottom of the slot that we're going to put in here. 
So I'm just going to use the blade itself to call that out. I'm going to mark it about like so, kind of in the middle of that shoulder. I'm going to leave some of it for a file fit. There we go. And then we have our slot marked out and we'll mill that in. Actually, let me just transfer that to the back too real quick. Like so, set it to the other one, boom. Like so, okay. Now we got matching marks on front and back. Okay, over at the mill, let's uh, swap out cutters and cutter holders for that matter. So power down. just to get some clearance, <clears throat> lock the spindle. And uh, I'm just gonna take this whole end mill holder out, leave the end mill in it, because I usually use it with that end mill right now. This is a quick switch 300 series end mill holder in the native quick switch 300 spindle installed in this mill. We're gonna use a 1 16th carbide end mill here, and it's got an eighth inch shank. So I'm gonna put in this uh, ZZ collet, double taper collet, collet chuck. We'll get the collet chuck locked into the quick switch 30 spindle, and we'll this little end mill up into the collet there. And I don't have a proper collet wrench for these ZZ collet chucks. I have to make one at some point, but this modified pair of pliers works for now. Okay, we're good there. Now let's take the old toothbrush, which you ought to have by your mill. Scrub that off of there. Yeah, yeah. Put that dude down in there. That's looking pretty good. Same deal here. Centered up widthwise in the vice jaws. A little tap to snug it. A tap from the top to knock it, knock the parallels tight. Another little snugging tap. Another little top tap. It's clamped well and the parallels are tight under it. So we're gonna get a slot that's perpendicular to the face of this little trim piece. Okay, now let's dial ourselves over on into the neighborhood of what we gotta cut. We'll wrap it back up. And actually, since I don't want to take the table all the way up there, and this is just a light little cut with a dinky little cutter, it's not bad form to just run the quill down somewhat. Now I could locate this with an end mill, or I could put a pointer in the spindle too. But uh, this thing is, we've given it some extra width and what I'll do is I'll just um, bring the cutter close enough and turn turn the uh, cutter so that the flutes are uh, the flute points are along the line here, and just crank this up to where the flute points are splitting the line, and that's a good enough location for this part. There we go. Now I'm going to lock the table in the Y axis. So that no matter what we do, that'll be our zero location for Y. Even when we flip it over, if we want to mill the backside, it'll stay the same. 
Now I'll start at one side, right here next to my mark, and let's go. Actually, you know what? I'm going to speed the spindle up, so let's put this in high gear, the head in high gear, and uh, here we go. Okay, so this is a, a 1 16th cutter. We plunge cut our way across, then took a couple of passes across, cranking in the X just to clean up all the webs between the plunges. So we've got a hole that's nominally, we got a slot that's nominally a 16th wide. Probably a little bit more than that. I mean, there's always a little bit of run out in an end mill, even in a fairly precise collet, and plunge cutting can induce a little bit of wobble, but at a 16th, this is uh, undersized enough that we don't have to worry too awful much about it. We're gonna take and remind ourselves what is the thickness here? 102. So, we're gonna do a little bit of math. A 16th is, we're gonna say it's 63 thou. It's actually like 62.5. But we'll round it up just to play it safe, 63 thou. Um, so 63 plus 37 thou would get us up to 100 thou. And the, the Ricasso is 102. So we're gonna say 39 thou. Let's bring that back down to 38, makes the math easier and it'll also remove a little bit more error, play it a little bit more safe. So 38 divided by two um, that is 19 thou per side. We need to mill 19 thou off of each side of this slot to get it out to 101 thou or 100 and 100.5 or so. Plus some run out will probably equal 102. Um, we're going to do that. So we have our location set here, uh, and, and the table locked in the Y. So I'm going to run the table to the lock with the crank. We're going to crank one way first, 19 thou. Let me aim this so you can see what I'm doing. Here's how you would do it without a DRO. Okay, so the table is locked and it has about 15 thou run out. That's why I love this mill. It looks old and beat up, but 15 thou run out in the Y is not too bad for something from the 80s. Okay, I'm going to unlock this. I'm going to set this to zero here. Yeah, now I'll unlock the table and we'll be able to run it in 19 thou by the dial. So there's 19. We'll lock the table again. And now we can take a couple of passes across this. Let's do that. good there okay now the y-axis is still locked we've taken half of our additional slot width um, and that's everything that needed to come off the one side so now we need to go to the other side feed the table out and take 19 off the other side so what I'm gonna do since the table is locked I'm gonna run it up to the lock to where it stops and now I'm going to set that for zero to, take the, to deal with the run out. And then I'm going to 
bring the table out 38 thou this way. We push it 19, we locked it. Now we're gonna take the run out out and then unlock it and take it 38 this way. So 10, 20, 30, 35, 38 and lock the table. And then we'll just take, you know, that like triple depth pass off of this side and uh, we'll have our slot. And we should be good there. Now on a lot of pieces, if this was thicker or if it was metal, like a bronze or you know brass or stainless or something, I'd maybe uh, mill it out wider on the backside to make the fit easier. But this being G10, shouldn't be any big deal. All right. Let's take it over and start fitting it up to the knife. Good enough fit. It just slip fits right up there and won't fall off. So you can see we're I got a little bit of, that, uh, of a Tokyo Wah fit there. So we need to file the shoulders in until it sits right up against them. And that's no big deal. Lots of little offhand filing I'll just do here on a leather pad at the uh, post vise. I really shouldn't have to take too awful much off of here. I'm definitely trying not to scuff the edges of the, the greater um, slot proper with the file here. Because I got the fit where I want it on the majority of the slot. I don't want to enlarge anything out there. So I'm just kind of using the end of the file here and just being conscious of not hitting the sides of the slot much and try to bring down a, a square curved shoulder fairing into the slot. Hmm, okay. I'm gonna do a little bit at a time. Try not to overdo it. around get the top or a little needle files g10 it's real hard on cutting tools whether it's carbide end mills or high-speed steel end mills or steel needle files it doles them but files like anything else are consumable Try not to abuse them, but they are going to dole in use. Sometimes you got to file G10. I try not to file carbon fiber much, though. Okay. Let's fair that out a little bit more to the flat here. And we'll just check that back and forth. Probably do some filing off camera if necessary here. For brevity's sake. Until it fits how we want. Let's check it now. It's better, but we got to take just a little bit more. All right, we got a nice snug fit on there. And 
that's how we want it to be and now we will just make the rest of the handle which is easier now that we have um, this, this thickness to work up against all right we're going to cut this out real quick Let's hold it up real quick and make sure it's good with the blade as drawn. Yeah, that's cool. Except, yeah, no, that's good. All right. Now, I'm going to do a couple of things. This block is too thick. So we're going to use this. And we went with uh, 750 thou for the handle cap. So we'll do the same for the handle block. I'm going to pick which side of the block to use. The pattern's a little bit more regular on this side. And there's a couple of little filled cracks in this on this side I think they're fine but if I can cut most of them off I will so we're just gonna go ahead and rip this side off since these little filled features are on this side and because the patterns better on this side anyway so I'm gonna scribe around the side of the block These guys set at 750 thou. Oops. And this wood isn't taking a super vivid mark with just scratching, so. I'm gonna go over that scribe mark with the mechanical pencil on the straight edge here and darken it some. This being a somewhat lighter wood, it's gonna be easier to see that. Much more visible mark there. I did install a new blade, made up a new blade for the bandsaw since the wrought iron smoked that other one for the big blade here. So this one ought to be nice and sharp for the wood. I'm going to set the bandsaw into high range though. Cool, easy peasy. Now with the handle block ripped on the bandsaw, Here's something that I usually do these days, since I got the good mill, is just clean up the rip cut on the mill. That way I get perfectly parallel faces on my size down block. It's easier to do precise work from that standpoint. Okay, that's good and tight. Parallels are good and tight. Now we were using that little 16th cutter. Um, Locked spindle. Let's get this out, out of here. And then let's get the entire collet chuck out of the spindle. And we're going to put in this quick switch 30 shell mill arbor with the two and a half inch diameter, 45 degree angle shell mill. This works pretty good for wood. You could also use a fly cutter. And uh, let's have a cut at it.
And a little chip out on the corners. It's no biggie, that's gonna get contoured away anyway. It looks like we cut those little filled cracks out entirely. So that's nice. Now we got a parallel block. Well guys, we've just passed the 50 minute mark and uh, that's about as long as I want this installment to be. I had a ton more stuff I could have put in this chapter uh, as far as the handle, but hey, we'll get to it. We'll finish the handle in the next chapter and we'll uh, be most of the way done with the knife. We'll see if we can complete it in, in chapter four, but if not, uh, five will be the last chapter. Anyway, thanks so much for watching and I uh, hope you all had fun, learned a little something maybe, laughed at me. I don't care. Um, at any rate, we'll see you on the next chapter. Take her easy.